All right, let's talk about the Curves tool in Photoshop. So this is one of the things that people get stumped by. Maybe you've been stumped by this, but it seems like such a simple thing that you feel like maybe you shouldn't be asking about it because you should get it. And it is simple once you understand it. What I want to tell you is the same thing that I tell my students in the classroom, and that is that the Curves tool in Photoshop is the single most powerful photo editing tool on the planet, bar none. We couldn't do anything without it. I certainly couldn't live without it. And I think that if you ask any serious photo editor the same question, they're going to tell you that they couldn't live without it either. If they tell you otherwise, either they don't understand what the curve does or they're lying to you. So I'm going to break this down for you once and for all. By the time you're done watching this, you're going to understand exactly what this tool does and why it's so important. So let's take a look. We all know how to create a curves adjustment layer. You just go to the adjustment palette and click on the curve. And then you get it. But then you get this box here. And what the heck is this, right? It's divided up into 16 parts. It's got a histogram in it. But what's this diagonal line? And what the heck are these numbers down here that are always changing? And what do they mean? It's pretty easy to figure out that if you pull the curve up, stuff gets brighter. And if you pull it down, stuff gets darker. But is there a more powerful way to leverage this? Yes. Is there a little more that you need to understand to be able to do that? Yes, and I'm going to show you right now. So the first thing is that if you want to reset your curve, all you need to do is either drag this point off the graph or hit the little button down here. I usually drag stuff off just like that. Secondly, we've got two sets of icons in this box, one here on the left side and one at the bottom. So the one at the bottom is the easier one to understand, I think. So this will create a clipping layer for you. This allows you to go back to the last state, which I don't have because I don't have an adjustment, but you can see that that just allows me to preview that last state. This button will reset the curve. This makes the curve visible or invisible. You can see the eyeball going on and off as I click on the eyeball down here. And this one, well, that will just delete the curves layer altogether. So we don't want to do that. This stuff over on the left, this stuff that you're probably not going to use very much except for this guy at the top. So this is for setting white point and black point and middle gray, but there are better ways to do that. This guy, on the other hand, is very handy. So this is the selective adjustment tool. And the selective adjustment tool, you can make this highlighted by default by going into your little pancake menu over here and telling Photoshop to use the selective adjustment tool, or they're calling it the auto select targeted adjustment tool by default. And if you check this menu item right here, then every time you open up a curve, this is going to be selected. Why is that valuable? Because I can roll over into the image and you see I get an eyedropper. And whatever tone I click on, Photoshop's going to add a point to the curve in that spot. And that can be really handy. Now, we don't see anything happening here because my layer is off, right? So we have to turn that on. So let's drag that off here. This is still selected. And now you can see that I'm making adjustments based on the area that I click on. And that can be really handy. I usually leave this on. And even if I decide to make my curve by hand, it doesn't hurt to leave this on. The only time that you're going to be able to do anything with this is if you go over into the image and start to click and drag around. So let's reset that. So now to the important part. What the heck is this and what's going on in here? Well, I've prepared a little demo for you. And we're going to take a look at that right now. So let's just go over here. So when we open the curve, we get this dialog box, as we all know. And the thing that's important to understand is what's going on here with this square and what these points are and what this line is. So what's happening here is that you've got two axes on a graph. I'm about to tell you everything I know about algebra, which isn't much because I'm in the 1 plus 1 equals 11 math club. But here I go. So this bottom axis is the x-axis. And the x-axis represents tonal value, the value of any particular tone. Whenever we click on the curve, we get a point, right? Any particular point on the curve, what's its tonal value? Like, what's its address? And this is the value that it came into the curve with. This value is going to remain constant unless you move around on the graph. But 
A tone that has a value of 63 is always going to have a value of 63 on the input side. The other axis is the y-axis, and that represents the brightness of the tone. So we have a black slider here and a white slider here. So the black slider represents zero or black, and the white slider represents 255 or white. So pure white and pure black. There's a spot right here in the middle of the graph where this line crosses the center. And if you're smart, which you probably are, you can probably figure out that this spot here represents 128 or middle gray. So zero, 128 and 255. So the way you should think of this and the way Photoshop wants you to think of this is as input and output values. And so the X axis represents the input, what the brightness of the tone, whatever tonal value you're bringing into the curve is when it comes in. And the output value, which is the up and down movement, is the brightness of that tone. So that might sound a little abstract right now, but trust me, you're gonna follow along here. So now I've got this point on the curve selected. All I did was click on this. And I'll show you how this all works in action in a minute. And what I have is an input value of zero, which makes sense, and an output value of zero because I haven't done anything to this. I haven't dragged this up. If I took this point and clicked on it and started to drag it up and kept it pinned to the left side of the graph here, the input number would not change. The output number, however, would begin to go up because I'm taking that zero tone and I'm making it brighter. I'm dragging it up, and so its output number is getting greater. So here I have 255, this white point over here selected. And this point has an input value of 255, and it also has an output value of 255. So knowing now that the up and down on this graph represents brightness, it makes sense that a tone that has a value of zero would have an output value of zero. Since this is brightness, it should be plotted on this graph in this lower left corner. And it also makes sense that a white tone with an input value of 255 and a brightness output value of 255 should be up in the upper right-hand corner. That's why this line is a 45 degree angle and that's why this is the default. This means that nothing has been done. No adjustments have been made. Black stays black and white stays white. So here is my middle gray. And you can see now that middle gray has an input value of 128 and an output value of 128. If I drag this up, Middle gray is going to get brighter, isn't it? It's going to start to creep up towards 255. If I drag it down, it's going to start to creep down towards zero. And the beautiful thing about this is that this is a logarithmic curve, all right? So I'm not just dragging this one tone down. Yes, I'm dragging the tone down, but I'm also affecting all the tones around it. And the effect gets lesser as we get farther away from the center point or the point that we're trying to affect. And I'll show you how that works in a minute. So if we want to darken a curve, we're going to pull a point down. So now what we have is we have selected this point and this has the input value of 134. And now it has an output value of 106. It's darker. And you can see this logarithmic curve, right? The further we get away from the 134 tonal value, this point, the less effect the curve has on the tones until we get all the way up to white and it doesn't do anything to the whites at all. This is still a 255, but you can see that we've got a greater difference between the 45 degree angle here than we do here. So there's more darkening going on in this area than there is in this area. And the same thing down here, there's more darkening going on here than there is here. And this is a beautiful thing. This is why the curve is such an awesome tool because it does a lot of the hard work for us. If we want to lighten the curve, then we're going to do just the opposite. We're going to take and drag up. And again, we can see the logarithmic curve in action. So one of the things that you'll see done the most is what we call an S-curve. 
and that's in the shape of an S. And what's happened here is we've darkened some dark tones, started out at 62, and now that tone is at 50. And so we've got a little darkening going on here. And then this tone up here started out at 193. That's what it came in at. And now it's lighter. It's 205 because this number is higher. So we've darkened some darks and we've lightened some lights. And you'll see that 128 really hasn't been touched. And so what have we done here? When you darken darks and lighten lights, you create contrast. So hopefully that's clear. There are some other things that you can do with the curve that are really awesome. And if you've never checked out what's underneath this drop down menu here, you should check it out. So if I just put a curve on here really quick and I click on this drop down menu, I've got red, green, and blue. Now, this is not the colors red, green, and blue in your image. What it represents is the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel, which are the RGB in the RGB color space, right? We have three channels, red, green, and blue. Now, they don't necessarily contain those colors, although those colors are going to be very prevalent in those channels. And that's a little bit of kind of advanced under the hood Photoshop stuff. But the important thing to know is that when you click on the red channel, you're going to get a histogram that represents the information that's in that channel. And now you've got a line on the 45 degree angle that's red because you're editing in the red channel. So what happens if you start to play around in here? Well, you're going to really change the way your image looks. If you pull it up, you're going to make your image more red. If you pull it down, you're going to make your image more cyan. And um, I'll show you that in just a minute. So here's the green channel. And here is the blue channel. And let's just turn off these numbers now. I think we don't need those anymore. And let's go over to a little presentation that I use from time to time to explain the color relationships in Photoshop. So the primary colors in the digital color space are red, green, and blue. If you're a painter or if you learn differently in grade school that they're red, yellow, and blue, you're actually right. But in the digital color space, it's red, green, and blue. Now, for those of you that are familiar with the printing world, and when I say printing world, I mean like the publishing printing world, people that print newspapers and books and so forth, they use a different color space. They use what's called the CMYK color space, cyan, magenta, and yellow. Okay, and so why are we using two different color spaces to get the same kind of color? Because this color space, we're taking a black screen and we're projecting light at it to get color. In this color space, we have a white piece of paper and we're putting ink on it to darken it in certain spots in certain ways to get the same colors, but we're doing it in opposite ways. So what that means is that these colors are opposite each other. These are the opposite colors. These are the opposing colors. And we call those colors complementary colors. They are exactly opposite each other on the color wheel. So if you ever need to know this, and if you're going to follow along with this and the next few tutorials that I'm going to do, you're going to need to understand these relationships. It's really easy you just write out red, green, and blue, and then cyan, magenta, and yellow in two vertical columns, and there's your opposites right there. And I'm gonna show you how this works right now. So let's go back to our image here, and I'm gonna turn all this stuff off. And this is what our image looks like in its raw state. So if I open up the red channel, and blow this up a little bit, and I pull the red curve up, I'm making my image more red. I'm adding redness to it. I'm adding more of the elements in the red channel to my image. If I pull the curve down, I'm actually making my image more cyan, which makes sense, right? Because red and cyan are opposite colors. If I go to the green channel and I pull the green curve up, I'm going to be adding more green to my image more of the elements of the green channel. And if I pull the curve down, I'm gonna be pulling green out, which is going to leave me with magenta. And that makes sense too, because right, green and magenta are opposite colors. And you can probably guess by now what's gonna happen in the blue channel. If I go to the blue channel and you can see that the blue curve has been really boosted up here. If I add blue, then what am I going to get? I'm going to get more blue in my image. And if I pull the curve down, I'm going to pull blue out and I'm going to end up with yellow. 
Now, there's some other things going on here with blend modes and stuff that we're not going to get into right now, but I hope that you can see what's happening here and why these color relationships are so important. Learn these color relationships because they are also the secret to a few other things in Photoshop that are really cool, like selective color, hint, hint. All right, so let's take a look and see how this works in real life. So if we go back to our image here, and I've got my curve now, and let's just say that I want to darken this stuff over here and maybe make my sky lighter, make the whites in my sky lighter. Well, I can do that very easily. I've got my little selective edit tool here, and all I have to do is just click on the area that I want to affect. And look, my mountains are getting darker. Now, this is all getting darker too, but we can fix some of that. And if I want my sky to get lighter, especially my clouds, I just click in the bright spot and pull those up. So what's going on here? If I click on this, I can actually read those values. So this tone came in with a value of 89 and it left with a value of 69. So I actually pulled that value down. This one came in with a value of 184 and it left with a value of 203. And so I actually brightened those and I've got this kind of weird looking S curve on here. Now, you know, yeah, great, but what about this stuff here? This is a problem. So one other thing that I wanna point out before I solve that problem is that the blend mode makes a big difference here. So we've got a blend mode of normal and you can see that not only is our tone being affected, but our colors being affected too. And a lot of times if we just click here and pull this blend mode and say, hey, Photoshop, leave the color alone and just affect the brightness or the luminosity, it's going to make a big difference in the way our image looks. And so now the image has gotten darker in the shadows, but I don't have that weird color saturation that can happen when I use a normal blend mode, especially with a darkening curve on reds and sometimes blues. They get really kind of funky looking. So I can you know, fix some of this darkening in some of these other areas just by clicking on one of this area. You can see that Photoshop is, it's right here. It's giving me um, a potential curve point. It won't give it to me until I actually click. And then I can drag that up and kind of fix that and then go into some of my darker stuff over here, maybe and fix that. Or I can just drag this in and fix this. So there's there are a lot of different ways to make adjustments to your image. And I know this kind of looks kind of crazy right now, but you can see that the curve gives you a ton of options. And the idea is to learn how to use it. Learn how to use your curves tool. I'm going to dig deeper in on this in another tutorial that's coming up, but I wanted you to understand the mechanics of the curve. And I hope that you have found this useful. If you like this video, the best thing you can do to help me out is to click on the subscribe button. And consider jumping over to the website and checking out some of the other things that I've got over there for you. Um, and, you know, maybe join the mailing list if you feel like you want to uh, be part of the tribe. So until next time, this is Jim Walninski. Be creative and have fun.